Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I am so sorry about our earlier session. I did hear back from Dr. Zuckner, and he was having internet difficulties this morning. So of all days, he felt horrible. But um, he will be presenting his slides today live at 2 p.m. Central Time. So it will just be at the end of our symposium today. I also wanted to remind you that you can utilize the chat feature throughout the day if you want to share a bit of your story with others who are attending the webinar or have questions on something outside of topics we will be discussing today. Also, um, our next presentation is on best practices in clinical care given by Dr. Bavanti Jones. Dr. Jones is an assistant professor of clinical physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Missouri, Columbia. She received her medical degree from Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine in 2014. She completed her residency in PM&R at Schwab Rehabilitation Hospital, University of Chicago. And Dr. Jones is a board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. She specializes in the rehabilitation of patients with neuromuscular diseases, amputations, and neurological injuries and disorders, including strokes. She's also the co-director of the University of Missouri's Adult Muscular Dystrophy Association Care Center and the ALS Center of Excellence. Dr. Jones is the medical director of the Stroke and Amputee Inpatient Rehab Unit at Rusk Rehabilitation Hospital, an affiliate of Encompass Health and MU Healthcare. She has a strong interest in advocacy for persons with disabilities. She is currently a member of the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and the Association of Academic Psychiatrists, or Physiatrists, sorry. Dr. Jones, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, are you, okay, are you, I can't hear you now. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, sounds good. I'm sorry. Today has been one <laughs> technical thing after another, so I appreciate your patience. Please go ahead and present. All right. Well, good morning, and I thank you for allowing me to talk to you guys a little bit more about what we consider breast practices in clinical patients with CMT. So one question I wanted to ask, am I advancing the slides or are you? I just want I'm, to I'm going to be advancing the slides. All right, so when we talk about neuromuscular disorders, um, I really break them down into four different categories. Um, and it's really based on what the, what the basis of the disorder is. So you guys have probably heard of multiple different disorders outside of CMT. Um, but how I break them down is based on what part of what we call the motor unit or the area uh, of movement that relates to the brain, the nerves, the spinal cord, and the muscle themselves. So if we look at some disorders like ALS and spinal muscular atrophy, those affect more so the areas of the spinal cord compared to when we talk about CMT which affects more of that peripheral nerve or the nerve that comes from the spinal cord and goes down into the muscles to lead to control of those muscles. There are other disorders out there like the muscular dystrophies, which affect the muscles directly, and uh, disorders like myasthenia gravis, which actually affect the area between the connection of the nerves and the muscle themselves. So how that signal gets from the nerve to the muscle. But all in all, all of these together lead to some form of weakness um, in a person which can impair their function down the road. We can go next slide. So when, like I said, when we're looking at our nervous system, it is a, a intense connection of a different neurons and control centers. So you have your brain, um, which you say you think a thought and I want to move a muscle, that signal has to come down from your brain into these long, what we call neurons, to your spinal cord and connecting your spinal cord before going out into your peripheral nerves to that are the nerves that actually directly connect to those muscles. And so this is a large system and it has little, a lot of parts along the way that can be injured. Um, but in our case, we're going to focus a lot more on 
um, the peripheral nerves, these areas out here. So when we look at CMT, we know that it's really the most commonly inherited neuromuscular or neurological disease that we're seeing um, throughout families. So what do we see in these patient, people who have CMT? So we say, well, we have motor problems. Um, what do our motor problems amount to? Weakness in the muscles, especially in um, your legs, but also in your hands and the muscles of your arms at times. And we call lower muscle tone. So instead of those um, muscles being strong, they get a little bit loose in the floppy here and easier to move around. Now, how do those motor problems that we see go into um, actual function, right? So if you're having weakness of your lower limbs, then you can imagine that you're gonna have um, imp impairments in your gait and your mobility. So some people are tripping or they get frequent ankle sprains because that, those ankle muscles aren't strong. Um, they can get cramping or um, different gait patterns where if your feet are dropping because you can't move them, now I have to hike my hip ups to walk just to clear my feet when I move around. When you have weakness in your hands and uh, your upper limbs, you can have problems with uh, hand dexterity. So our grip, our ability to hold a pen and pencil um, can all be affected with those impairments. So outside of movement, we talk about also sensory things. So um, we know that nerves control movement, but they also control how we interact with things. How do we feel things? So when there's damage to those nerves, people can get uh, what we call parasthetics or pins and needles or burning sensations um, in the areas where the nerves are damaged. Nerves also can uh, go to your joints and those joints are able to tell you where your body in space. And this is important for us to maintain balance. And so when those nerves are injured and you lose your ability in your feet to know that your feet are on the ground or know if you're leaning to the left or leaning to the right, then um, that also can make it difficult for people um, to walk. And then again, numbness as well as paresthesias. So again, how does that affect our function? It affects our balance and our coordination, um, and it can affect um, your response to injury. So if you have numbness in your feet and you step on a nail and you're not feeling that nail, um, or you step on something hard and you're not pulling back, you're at a higher chance of injuring yourself. And if you get wounds down there, um, it can be more difficult for them to heal. So for um, our practice of uh, care for people with CMT, we really say this is a coordinated process. It's a process that involves many people from many different specialties, um, and you'll hear from the majority of them, a lot of them today. But it really includes people from rehabilitation medicine like me, um, but also our rehabilitation team, including our therapists, the orthopedic surgeons and podiatrists for management, um, and then people who ultimately get pulmonary involvement, or um, we're talking about genetics, just le learning about uh, what is the gene that is causing our CMT or maybe passed down in our family. But all of us work together around every individual with CMT or any neuromuscular disorder to come up with an individualized plan of care. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So um, I talk a little about this multidisciplinary team, but here are some of the thoughts if everybody uh, doesn't know, but here's just some of the thoughts of what each member of the team does. So some clinics have are neurology-based, so have a neurologist as um, the main provider in the clinic. There are some clinics that have um, physiatry, which is me, uh, which I am, rehabilitation medicine. But our roles in the clinic are slightly different when people aren't sure. So um, with our neurologists, we are, and with physiatrists like clinic, it's evaluation and diagnosis, um, treatment medications, um, referral out if we need it to genetic counselors, mental health, um, and enrollment in research studies as needed. 
You also have your physiatrists like me who are um, more in tune a lot of times with the functional status, meaning ability to do things throughout the day, the things that we care about, like getting dressed and walking and moving around. So we get to focus on um, that long-term rehabilitation of those functional goals. So a lot of times the physiatrist is the one writing for your uh, more specific uh, orthotics for your feet. And I know they're be talking of that today. Um, other prescriptions for other bracing if needed, hand bracing. Prescriptions for the therapist also. Um, because uh, as far as I should, we lead the uh, interdisciplinary rehab team. Um, the rest of the people that you're seeing clinic, again, are your genetic counselors or social workers, um, your orthopedic surgeons, your podiatrists, your, psych your psychologists, because having a progressive disability at times can be trying on um, how people interact emotionally and are able to handle uh, some of the changes at home. So having a psychologist and or a social worker helps with that, along with the therapist. So again, um, a lot of people don't hear about uh, my specialty, which is physical medicine rehab or, or physiatry. Um, letting, I want to let you guys know a little bit more about what we are. So we're the field of medicine that really um, works to, again, restore function and ability to people who may have physical impairments. So the groups that we work with are not only people with neuromuscular disorders like CMT, but also people who have spinal cord injuries, who had strokes or amputations, who've had hip fractures, or um, have had poly trauma, what we call it, or multiple injuries from motor vehicle accidents and things like that. So in a lot of ways, we don't always work towards the cure of things, even though that is an important component of it, but we work to allow you to get back to um, some of the things that you love to do today, whether that's um, act activities or sports, um, or whether that is just walking down the hall, um, that is a lot of what we were able to focus on. So what are our general uh, goals of rehab or uh, care for a person that may have CMT? So our whole uh, idea is one, we want to maximize and prolong any independent function and uh, locomotion ability to ambulate that we can. We want to minimize any secondary physical complications that may occur during um, due to CMT. And then we might want to add uh, access to a full integration into the society, whether that's for our younger population going into school and finding ways that you're able to get around at your school and participate in activities, or whether that's going back to work. So again, our big mainstays of rehabilitation are going to be exercising, strengthening, um, as well as stretching, rolling of motion, and then addressing adaptive equipment. So when I talk about um, rehabilitation and care, I like to talk about you know, direct therapy treatment, when you're going into the office and you're talking to our therapists. So a lot of times with TMT, we're more focusing on physical and occupational therapy. What I like to think of physical therapy as um, the big muscle movements and uh, occupational therapy as the smaller muscle movement, fine muscle movement, but also um, uh, looking at function of uh, maybe doing things like getting dressed, eating, things like that that they work on. Um, but they'll tell you a little bit later uh, what they like to call themselves. Um, but really, you know, our goal of this therapy is to work on those uh, range of motion. So then what um, is the role of the physical therapist? So really, um, you want to have, when you're um, dealing with a neuromuscular patient with CMT, you want to have a therapist that is uh, educated in those fields. Because sometimes it can be different treating someone with um, CMT versus treating somebody who had a hip factor. Because we talk about progressive changes in individuals uh, over the years as um, their symptoms may progress. So the goal of the therapist is really to develop that individualized plan uh, for you as a person with CMT and focusing on what your abilities are and uh, addressing what your complication might be. 
And then also um, we want to be able to identify and prescribe any aids or equipment that may be beneficial for you. And that again changes over the years from whether some people are walking with canes or crutches or if uh, or just braces or orthotics or um, to the people that may end up needing to use wheelchairs. Um, also, you know, they provide advice on helping with things like transfers, um, getting from one surface to another, one area to another. And then they also can uh, monitor respiratory function when you're in there with them to see if you're straining or struggling doing any of those exercise processes. Um, again, our occupational therapists, the big, uh, some of the big things they focus on are going to be maintaining strength and flexibility in the hands and your upper extremities, um, identifying and addressing difficulties of what we call activities of daily living. So that's going to be some things from brushing your hair to brushing your teeth to getting your clothes on to learning how to get on and off the toilet if you need to. Um, and again, they can recommend appropriate assistive devices. Um, and then um, some therapists can even come within the home and identify if there's any barriers of the home that might need to be changed and suggest any modifications uh, to allow that individual to function better at home. So what are we looking at, say, in our goal center for um, rehab? So exercising is important um, through all levels of disability that you may have with CMT. Um, now, the type of exercises you're doing and the length of time and then endurance may change over time, but exercising is important. The other important things um, for our back practice is really to uh, manage our range of motion uh, of our extremities and of our joints, um, including stretching. I think you'll have to click through these, but we know that if we're not moving um, and we're not using our muscles, our muscles actually get smaller and they shorten. And some of the problems is certain muscles that shorten, they can actually pull on joints and abnormal function and lead to what we sometimes see in C what CMT with um, the clawing of the toes and the high arches when those muscles aren't um, balanced and working properly. So being able to stretch can help decrease the risk of some of the contractures that people may develop. And that is also in the hands, if the fingers start to curl up and get contracted, um, we wanna really work on uh, stretching and doing range of motion activity for the hand. Um, and so stretching not only affects just the muscle, but all the tissue around it, your skin gets tight if you don't, uh, if you don't stretch that area. So stretching helps loosen that skin back up and loosen those blood vessels back up there so that things are moving uh, in the proper function. Um, big thing about stretching is you have to integrate it within to your daily process every day. It doesn't do well for you to stretch one day and do nothing the rest of the week. It has to build, be built into the everyday process. So what we like to do is prevent the development of contractures. And so contractures are these tightening of um, our muscle, muscle tendon, so that you're not able to stretch out a, um, a joint as well. So whether your foot gets stuck down or your toes get stuck curled, those are, can be considered a contracture. So how do we do this? Really finding a proper position that allows you to have adequate stretch on those areas that might be tightening down. Again, doing a, a proper home stretching uh, protocol um, and, and building it into your everyday. Using uh, splints and bracing. So down in that left corner, I have some hand splints that we sometimes can use to keep that hand and those fingers open. And a lot, sometimes we do this because even though you're weak there, we know you might get contractures, um, we want to contract you in at least a hand position that might be functional to at least allow you maybe to hold something in that cupped hand or not. Um, so that's sometimes how we'll use those bracing. Um, there are other things that some people do is if your contractures are severe enough, they can do um, a process of making casts that stretch those muscles and you have to go through several casts. Um, and then I also like 
putting people on in standing frames or tilt tables if they're able to, to handle that because that puts some weight bearing through the legs and that can put some stretch on those um, feet and lower muscles that may be getting tight. So um, a lot of people with CMT, we end up using orthotics or bracing. And there are many, many different types of braces that can be used out there. And I know that we'll be talking more about that sometime today. Um, but why do we use them? To help maintain function and independence as long as possible, to correct and improve alignment, control movement in some ways. So if your ankles are rolling in, um, because you're weak on one side, these braces can be put to help stabilize that ankle. It may also reduce pain if you have uh, a joint that hurts because it's pulling the wrong way. Um, and so again, there are just different levels of complexity. Um, there are braces that only include just your ankle um, and they can go all the way up to including your hips um, and long braces like that. So there are many different types that can be used. So um, other components of, can we go back one slide? The, uh, there's one in between. So the other thing, um, the other thing is that there is the surgical management of CMT, um, which is a mainstay in treatment for um, several individuals, especially when you're starting to develop uh, the severe foot contractures um, that we see. So we know with CMT, a lot of individuals have these very high arch fit and these very curled toes. And what is happening is that you have weakness in what we call dorsiflexion, the ability of your ankle to actually lift up and you get tight um, toe muscles that actually extend the joints of your toes so that that was what brings the toes up um, it can result in this high claw foot um, eventually over time if we're not correcting some of these deformities they become fixed and they become stiff and they become difficult to manage so a lot of times surgical correction can be um, required in cases of people that are having pain or chronic sprains or even just difficulty getting shoes on. So what are our goals of our interventions? Um, we like to realign the joints, correct uh, bony deformity, and try to balance out muscles uh, in individuals who have CMT. Again, not every surgery um, is the same for everybody and not everybody needs the same thing. Um, so it's definitely individualized. So um, what are some of our stages of our surgical intervention? You can be early stages, some of the minimally invasive things we can do. We can release some of that muscle, uh, or some of that tissue, what we call plantar fascia on the bottom of the foot. Um, if you guys have ever heard of plantar fasciitis, that's that same area that can get inflamed, but we can, that can get tight and help pull on and contribute to the high arches in that foot. So those can, um, that procedure can be done to, re to release some of the stress in that area. We can um, actually lengthen your Achilles tendon in the back of your leg to uh, allow more movement and range of the ankle. There are other things like tendon transfers or correction of hammer toes that may be helpful in preserving the use of orthotics and preserving mobility. But as these uh, contractures get more fixed, then we have to do more um, complex surgeries like other lengthenings of tendons or rearrangement of tendons so that um, your foot can move in the proper direction or even in some cases making joint fusions if needed. So um, there's several different types of surgical interventions. So um, with tendon transfers, the goal is to work to improve the balance uh, of the motors of the foot. Um, remove the deforming forces, so removing abnormal pulling areas um, that may be pulling too hard to allow weaker muscles to be able to move. Uh, but they don't work so well if your, def the, your foot deformity is fixed and it doesn't move. Um, osteotomy, so going into the bone and changing things, are often done with tendon transfers and the whole goal is to realign the foot. 
The other things, um, like I mentioned earlier, are your Achilles tendon lengthening and your uh, plantar fascia release. Now, for some people with CMT, they can develop spinal deformities as well. Um, and depending on what we look at, some studies say about 26 to 37 percent of people get some form of spinal deformity. Um, and that is um, a curve in your spine. Um, a lot of these curves don't respond to bracing that you may see um, in individuals who don't have CMT but get, suddenly get a curve in their spine. Uh, and some of these do actually require surgical erection, um, uh, either fusion or rods placed in there to, uh, to stabilize that spine. Another thing is um, hip dysplasia. So this abnormality in the hips so that, um, and this is due to maybe weak muscle or muscle imbalances around those hips so that your hips don't align properly. Sometimes the surgeons kind of have to go back in there and correct the alignment of their hips uh, to allow for better function and better mobility. Other things, so what are we looking at um, when we tell people with CMT, well, what do we go home and eat? Um, well, someone asked a question, well, is there any specific neuromuscular or nutrition goals for CMT? And I would say, you know, there have been no real studies out there to say specifically one type of diet is better than the other for CMT. We know that um, over time, as symptoms progress, people have less physical function and decreased activity. Um, and with decreased activity, you use less energy. So without changes in your diet, if you're eating the same thing, but moving more and using less energy, people are at higher risk of getting obese and um, having things like high cholesterol. And ultimately those things like obesity and high cholesterol can actually lead to um, diabetes um, which also has its own uh, effect on the nerves and can complicate things with CMT. So the idea of what I say about um, nutrition with CMT is that we really want to uh, keep a well-rounded diet, something that is lower in processed food, uh, lower in just pure sugars or simple carbohydrates, um, like your sugars and syrups, and eating things that are more complex, so your, um, your fruits, your veggies, um, and um, and also, you know, managing things that not are not as high in fat if we can. So really, try to manage our weight. And this diet will change um, as symptoms progress, and it's different from individual individual because everybody's metabolism is a little bit different. Um, but I like to just say this is kind of my central tenement on um, nutrition in CMT. So. With all this being said, and um, you know, all the rehab technology that is still being diagnosed, the, the treatment uh, strategies that are going out there in research, we know that our, our goals and our plan for our CMT will change over the years. So um, the whole idea behind what we do as your uh, MDA clinic team or as your neuromuscular team as a whole is really to customize care for each individual who may have um, CMT and customize it to each stage of the disease um, that you're at. So I think those were all the things that I had for today to kind of talk to you guys about. And I want to leave it open for questions that may occur. Hi, Dr. Jones, thank you very much for that. Um, we do have a couple questions. Let me see here. Okay, we have one question here. How do you locate surgeons who are skilled in these specialized surgical procedures? So some of the ways that you can locate a surgeon is if you have an MBA care clinic team, a lot of times they have people that they refer um, people to their patients too, so they'll know what surgeons are in that area and that may be uh, helpful. Um, other times you can actually just uh, contact the orthopedic department of whatever hospital area that you're at and ask for any individual with 
that does ankle and foot surgery. So usually those are the ones who um, know more about this. Great. Okay. This person's asking, I am a 78-year-old male diagnosed with CMT about 10 years ago. I have been wearing braces for, or I have been wearing two braces for about six and a half years. It seems to be progressing more rapidly. Do you think that I will progress to the stage that I will need crutches? So uh, um, everybody changes a little bit differently. Um, and our mobility needs as this progresses do change. So there is a possibility that you may end up needing some type of device to help if you're not already using a cane or uh, crutches down the line, there is a possibility that you may need that. And um, a lot of patients do progress to that state. Okay. Um, I have CMT1A and I'm contemplating below the knee amputation due to severe deformity to my ankle and foot, mostly due to past corrective surgeries. Do you find other CMT patients who have made this decision? If so, what are the recovery issues for CMT patients post amputation? And what is your opinion and experience regarding the outcomes? So I say I, I do not have a lot of patients who actually do um, the amputations for the CMT specifically and are still ambulatory. A lot of times when people are, are um, getting amputations, they're at the point where they're not ambulatory and they're seated and it doesn't matter as much because they're seated. Now, um, but if you're having significant pain, um, inability to stand, there are some benefits to um, amputation as a whole that the deformities cannot be corrected. Um, some of the benefits are that um, once you get rid of that area, that is contracted and you're possibly be eligible for a prosthesis. And the eligibility for a prosthesis is different depending on what your other leg looks like and what your other function is. Um, but if you were to become eligible for a prosthesis, then it'll allow you to um, be able to move a little bit better. Um, now the issue with any surgery to the nerves is that with CMT, it, affects these peripheral nerves, and it can be more difficult for those nerves to heal, and you may have more of those post-surgical um, nerve pain symptoms that we see in people who have amputations. Um, just e even those individuals who have amputations that don't have CNT and may have just um, diabetic-associated neuropathy in their lower legs, they have more issues with pain uh, post-surgery. Okay. So, that's something that your nerves are gonna heal a lot differently than somebody with more healthier nerves higher up. Yes, okay, great answer, thank you. Is weightlifting beneficial for people with CMT? So I think you can, you can uh, weightlift, because weightlifting is good for strengthening. So you can do that as long as you are taking care to not overexert yourself. Um, because I believe maintaining muscle strength for as long as possible is what's going to keep you mobile and um, what's going to keep you moving and um, going to help your range of motion. So I like weightlifting, um, but I don't necessarily think you need to be a 300 pound dead, you know, doing some. <laughs> of course. But um, keeping it in whatever your functional ability is. Okay. What is the likelihood that somebody with CMT would progress not to be able to walk? I think that's kind of a on individual basis. Yeah, so I mean, it is an individual basis because uh, everybody progresses at different rates. So as we've even heard from these questions, some individuals are not diagnosed until they're much older. And then some individuals are diagnosed younger, especially you know with the strong familial forms you're seeing uh, it di diagnosed younger. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have the exact number in front of me of how many people actually do progress to non-ambulation, mm -hmm. um, but I do, I would say it's still, it's a good number of, of people that do eventually. Now we don't never, we never know at one point though. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a question here. What are your thoughts about vitamins or supplements that are advertised for nerve regeneration or nerve health? So there's really not any good vitamins out there that are truly able to, um, either re reverse the causes of CMT or really affect um, anything done with CMT. I like people, as long as you are well balanced on your vitamins. So, you know, I like people to check their vitamin D, their vitamin B12. 
um, your vitamin Bs. Those are all uh, good things to look at because they in themselves independently have an effect on nerve function if you're low. So I like to say if you check your B12 and you're normal, keep doing what you're doing. Keep maintaining your regular diet. But if they were to check your, B your B12 or your vitamin D and you're abnormal, I would suggest you, um, you know, take a supplement until you get back into that normal range. But the reality is there's nothing that really makes that much of an effect vitamin-wise for CMT. Okay. That's interesting. Someone is wanting to know your opinion on the NeuroSwing AFO. Are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that specific one. Um, like I said, there's so many out there um, that, uh, and uh, different, even um, different makers of different AFO have the okay. same thing, but name them differently. So I'm not 100% sure on that one. Okay. Is there any evidence that too much B12 by injection causes uh, liver damage? So uh, I don't actually know that off the top of my head, the, the maximum doses of that, i say. Okay. Um, well, we can answer just a few more. Does the rate of degeneration increase as you age? It can. Okay. And that's due to normal changes in individuals. So in a normal, what we consider healthy individual, over time, our body changes, our nerves become more susceptible to damage in general. Um, and so with CMT, when you add that on top of just the normal body function, it can seem like things are changing or a little bit worse the older that we get. You also have the idea that you've been managing um, these changes for an extended period of time, so you're at higher risk of de developing contractures and things from that sort the, um, the older that you are. So it can change your mobility for sure. Okay, let me see here. We have an anonymous question here. I would like to stay as active as possible while I can, but when I ask about good exercises to help with CMT1A, I'm always told, quote, only low impact. Why? Is it only a precaution because of balance issues and risk of falling higher, risk of sprains? Or can you actually do damage to your muscles with CMT? So the biggest thing that we worry about with CMT is, um, so we know it affects the nerves and, and it affects that connection between the nerves and the muscles. So when those nerves do um, eventually die out or lose their ability to signal the muscles, the muscles themselves can get weak. And, um, and so uh, over time doing a lot of activities, because the way we build strength is for our muscles over time, they actually break down and rebuild themselves and break down and rebuild themselves and make, to make you stronger. Um, and so when you're, um, so when you're are doing some of these activities, especially these things that are requiring a lot of strength or a lot of muscle breakdown, um, but you don't have necessarily the best nerve signal, mm -hmm. it can be problematic down the line. Um, but I say, you know, it varies depending on your course, what activities you can do. I, um, I like if you can early in your course and you can tolerate some running or walking on a treadmill, I like to do that. I also like people to do things like pool therapy um, because that takes off a lot of weight mm -hmm. off the joints and other things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the issues with people with CMT is because they can't feel they don't have that sensation or that ability in their joints to know when there's damage being done. Um, sometimes people warn you from doing things that cause a lot of repetitive okay. trauma to your lower legs because um, you can get fractures and other things um, if we're not careful sometimes. Well, that's good to know. Good, good tips there. What are some muscle strengthening workouts someone who has had reconstructive foot surgeries and hasn't been able to use their leg for over seven months to help build their strength back up? So um, I would say this, I think we're gonna have a really good um, talk with our physical therapist uh, a little bit later. And yeah. I, maybe we can save that question for then. Okay. I'll come back with the therapist then and we can answer it there. Cause I'd love to have her input as well. So then I'll also depend on my therapist to help me out with. Okay. Um, what do you think about supplements for pain management like turmeric? So, I, I mean, I like 
turmeric. I don't think it hurts. Um, it's good for inflammation, especially because pain and CMT is a multifaceted issue. Um, so when we talk about pain and CMT, it's not only just the nerves itself, but also those, mus those um, muscles can create pain when they are weak or dying down. Um, also the joints. So if you have abnormal positioning of your joints those, uh, and your bones, those also can have pain. And they require different treatments for those type of pain. Okay. So people for um, joint achy pain, just like if you were to have arthritis, because basically this is a repetitive trauma arthritis type situation, um, they take things that decrease their inflammation. So turmeric is one of those things that have been found to decrease uh, general inflammation in the body and may help mm -hmm. uh, some of your pain in addition to other medications that some people might be on, like gabapentin or Lyrica, uh, to help with those types of pain, or NSAIDs like ibuprofen. As well. Are those the main prescriptions for neuropathy pain associated with CMT? Um, the gabapentin, yes. and, uh, yeah. Gabapentin and the Lyrica. Some mm -hmm. people are on Cymbalta, or okay. duloxetine is another. Uh, medication has been found to stabilize nerves. And there are actually even out there some um, anti-seizure medications. Okay, interesting. Like uh, carbamazepine and Tegretol that stabilize the nerves. I don't see them use as, we don't use them as much with just specifically CMT, but they are options if they're refractory to other treatments. Okay. Um, what are, do you know of anything about having an intense itching feeling? Um, this person yes. doesn't necessarily have pain, but they do have sporadic, intense itching. Yes. So um, those way, when the nerves are damaged, it can do, produce a myriad of different symptoms or different types of kind of pain-ish or abnormal sensation. And itching is okay. one of them, along with burning, ting tingling, sharp shooting pain. All those things can be seen with neuropathy. Okay. Very interesting. Is there anything that you prescribe for that? So um, usually, so if it's localized in one area, sometimes um, uh, I can use like topical things like a topical lidocaine to help with that. Okay. Um, other times it's really, again, the, the gabapentins or the lyricas or the symbols. Okay. It's still a neuropathic type symptom and okay. it's normal firing signals of the nerves. Okay. Um, just a couple more here. People have suggested stem cell injections. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? So right now, there's no data out there that is really saying that any types of stem cell injections are making a difference in our CNT population right now. I mean, there are studies that are still being conducted, um, but I, I would, any individual right now that will be considering stem cells, I would tell you to hold off on that um, because there's just not enough data. Okay. All right, I'm just going through my questions here. We've had a lot of great questions, everyone, so thank you very much. Um, Okay, there's a person here um, inquiring about his, the pointer finger and thumb that are curling and weak, and I would like to probably just hold off to that for answering that question till the PT and OT come on. Do you, is that correct? Okay. Yeah. We will answer that in a little bit. Um, I think that is all that I see for right now. Um, oh, here's one, I'm sorry. What can be done to help those with CMT who have reduced pulmonary function? So um, one of the things that we like to do is we like to have people involved with our respiratory therapists, especially if you have reduced pulmonary function. Um, but also there are things with learning how to manage breathing with exercise and activity. So there are some actual physical therapists out there who um, can do some cardiopulmonary rehab um, as well. So um, you have to find that specialized PT. And again, maybe at your um, MDA clinic, they might have some suggestions of somebody who may be able to help out with that. Okay. But yeah. Okay. Um, we, I'll, we have a couple more that um, popped in here at the top of the hour. 
Does the severity one way or another based on others in the family with CMT dictate on how a younger child might get CMT? So the question is, do, will they look the same as the family basically? I believe so, yes. Yeah. So a lot of times, yes, in families, things tend to follow a, a similar course. Um, but again, each person's a little bit different because your genetics are going to be a little bit different depending on who that other parent is. Mm -hmm. um, and so it may be different from person to person. But I would say, you know, if you do have a strong family history of it and a similar path for everybody, then I would say probably um, that being similar too. Okay, okay. Is a low creatine level in blood work common with CMT? So it can be um, for people who have significant progression and significant muscle loss. So a lot of times the creatine that you're seeing is um, it's related to muscle mass. Mm -hmm. um, and so over time, if you've lost significant amount of muscle um, or you're not ambulatory, you can actually see a lower level of that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jones. I am just perusing a couple questions and they are really related to um, some PT and OT issues. So I think we'll just hold those for our next session. Okay. Uh, I do want to say thank you very much and I appreciate your time on Saturday. We are going to be um, resuming at 1210 Central Time. And so please, you can just keep your um, computer up, but feel free to take a break, go get some water, and we will resume with bracing and equipment. Thank you, everyone.